During the, uh, the break, I was reflecting upon the first time I gave a, um, a seminar of this nature, uh, May the 22nd, 1993, at the Sheraton Hotel, downtown uh, Civic Center, Los Angeles. <clears throat> and I was naive enough to think at that time, since I had entered the coaching industry, and I had easily, the, uh, by a factor of 100 or 1,000, more, accomplished more than any other business coach on the planet, that we would have to queue them up with security guards. It was $1,000 a head for a one-day event like this venue. And we would need security guards, and we would queue them up like 20 across and six, 700 deep. And we uh, had a room that could hold, I think it was 2,700 people. We had 141, of which probably 20 were there, uh, were my relatives. Maybe more than 20 were my relatives. I'm not that naive anymore, and I realize that knowledge doesn't come easily, uh, and especially in business. And so um, we are going to move very rapidly through the rest of this morning until lunch, and then we have a lot, a lot of stuff to cover in the afternoon. We were on the 15 keys to super success, and we're on number six now, which is um, you are who you associate with. And I always remember this because my mother, when I was dating, used to tell me, Dan, you go to bed with dogs and you get up with fleas. Now... <clears throat> This was before AIDS. Quite clearly, I would be dead today if AIDS had existed in the 60s. There's no question whatsoever. And um, the, uh, but she was referring to the quality of a young woman that I dated in the 60s. And, um, but you are who you surround yourself uh, by. And as Machiavelli said, the first method for estimating the intelligence of a ruler is to look at the men he has around him. He obviously wasn't a 21st century man because he says the men and not the, the people, the men and women. Now, just think about as we go through these, through these next slides, if you were to be judged by who you associate with, play golf, tennis, have a meal with, etc., etc., just think about it. Now, in American parlance, and Dan Pena parlance, stop hanging around with morons. It's quite simple. Now, some of the morons actually went to proper schools, the, what I call the Winchester Etonian moron, end of the continuum, then on to Oxbridge, etc., etc. The other end of the moron continuum didn't go to school any place, or went to one of those other schools, those institutions of higher learning. As Richard DeVos, a friend of mine, founder of Amway, if you hang around with poor people, you'll always be poor, and then you'll spend the rest of your life complaining about it. That's actually very British, and DeVos is no Brit, but he's a multi-billionaire, and it's quite frankly, one of the reasons I don't associate with my family, my peers, family peers, is because I got tired of ask, people asking me, why do you still work, Dan? Because if you run with cripples, You'll learn how to limp. We're talking about mental cripples. Ladies and gentlemen, this country has a lot of mental cripples. I just read the FT, and it brought all back very clearly in focus. And for those of you that want to read August the 2nd Financial Times, their news service, you'll read about the slander suit I just settled with the Financial Times, and they paid me. August 2nd. I'm very pleased about that. It took a lot of money and a lot of time to beat the FD down. They didn't roll over. It was Dunkirk all over again for them, though. You know what it takes to sue the FT and win? Do you have any comprehension? That's the same kind of determination that I've had and the high-performance people that I keep on talking about have. And I will stick it up the backside of the FT to the day they put dirt on me. Every chance I get. I can't wait to go on TV shows. 
Now, we used to do this to the audience, and we'd start down here and we'd work down. You make a list of everybody you, you, you've done, you've talked to, not done in the sexual sense, that you do business with, that you talk to, that you had lunch with, etc., in a week. Then you make another list of all your goals, personal, financial, etc. Then you match the lists. And we used to start like with this woman right here on the end, and by the time I'd get down to this guy down at the other end, and he'd have to go to the bathroom. Most women talk to their mothers six, eight, ten times a week. That's neurosis feeding neuroses. Less than 2% of the people that you deal with on a weekly basis have anything to do whatsoever in any shape, manner, or form with any goal that you have for your future. Then why do you talk to them? You talk to them because it's comfortable. It's comfortable. And unfortunately, your parents and your relatives and even your children, and for some of you old people in the audience, your grandchildren, fall into those categories. <coughs> the most contagious thing is not a positive attitude, it's a negative attitude. In 1978 or 9, when Mrs. Thatcher took over the Tory party and the government, there were uh, 8,800 and some millionaires in Great Britain. When they gave her the boot, a few years ago, I think there were 64 or 66,000 millionaires in the country. I don't know how, if there's more or less under the new administration. I don't know that number. But it's not something you go around and brag about, being wealthy in this country. Most people are entrenched with ne and they're negative, they're skeptical. And there's a lot of skepticism about wealth in Europe, a lot more so than America. You simply cannot achieve the kind of success that we're talking about hanging around with mentally deficient losers that think that life owes them a living. I, I have a whole speech about the uh, National Health Service here I can go through. Although, when I was seriously hurt, last time some of you saw me speak three months ago, I had just been in a, a near-fatal accident, and uh, I thought I was getting a heart attack and because my... Uh, sternum was broken and I didn't realize it was broken and I staggered into the hospital one of the hospitals here a guy my age gripping his chest I mean I was in the, 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 I didn't have to fill out any paperwork nobody asked me for a check a credit card nothing and I got a young doctor from Dundee and he said uh, he thought I'd just been hit by a car and I said no the accident was actually three months ago and he said well he says you're in so I wasn't having a heart attack but I liked National Health then I was a purport I I could support national health because they took very good care of me in a quick fashion. Now, uh, the fact that you have to wait so many years for a hip transplant and some other things is, is another story. Now, this whole seminar could be based on one precept, or actually two or three precepts, and one of which is modeling. Following in the footsteps of somebody that has already been super successful and mimicking them, so to speak, imitating them. Now, I can't remember if it was Socrates was the protege of Plato. Yeah, that's the way it was, wasn't it? Socrates was the protege of Plato. He mimicked Plato. Now, Socrates said it a little differently. This is kind of Dan Pena's way of saying it, but he said the same three things. There's three ways, three methods, three different precepts to follow to be super successful. One is trial and error, and that takes too damn long. Two, over time, and that kills you ultimately. And three, copying somebody. Socrates said the same thing. Modeling someone that's successful. When we talk about mentors, and I talk about my mentors, and I've already mentioned Konstantin Gratzos, I modeled what he did. I dressed like him. I, I didn't talk like him. In business situations, I talked like him, but he never swore, never smoked, did drink. It's truly the fast track to success. Why would you want to, you know, that's what parenting is supposed to be all about. In my judgment, being a parent is the least prepared thing anybody's ever been put on this earth to do. But that's what our children are, you know, in theory supposed to do. Mimic us. How good of an example are you to your children, for those of you that are parents? And in using that same formula, how is it that you look to somebody or do you look to somebody? What if they were following your footsteps in business? And in some cases, they are, unfortunately for them. 
What kind of example are you setting? What kind of fast track to success are you giving to your children or, and or grandchildren vis-a-vis -vis business? Think about it. For those, some of you, you don't want to think about it. It's obvious by looking at the faces in the audience. Get yourself a mentor. How do you do that? Well, some of you, it's, you got to pick up the phone. I called W. Clement Stone about a year and a half ago. He's still alive in Chicago. He was the father of positive mental attitude, amongst other things. He's 95 or 96 years old. And I asked him to go out to dinner, and his house had just burned down. And he said that, well, you know, um, he was living in a hotel, and he said that he, he really couldn't because of his house. But, I mean, I got through to him on the first call. I mean, to scale a mountain of success, you need a guide. I wanted W. Clement Stone because he had worked with Napoleon Hill, who had written Think and Grow Rich. I mean, all top athletes, sports women, uh, sports men and women, excuse me, even singers, everybody has a coach. Even Bill Gates has a mentor. You know who it is? Warren Buffett. The richest man in the world has the second richest man in the world as his mentor. A mentor is nothing more than a high-performance coach. And I've had three. I've already talked about Mr. Grazos. I had Mr. Gerald Orman, who's still alive. He's 80 years old. Founder of Orman Industries. And I had a, a gentleman named Jim Newman, the founder of PACE Organization, which stands for Personal and Company Effectiveness. And his stable of mentees goes from Henry Kissinger to the Joint Chiefs of Staff to the founders of McDonnell Douglas Aircraft. And I could go on and on and on. And I was privileged to work with him for 20 years. You've all seen a, a similar saying, when the, teacher, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Well, in olden times, they were the masters. They were the master mentors, the people that coached you from the time that you were a very young person through middle age until they normally passed away. Um, there are no easy ways to become a high-performance individual, ladies and gentlemen. And there are no shortcuts, shortcuts to success, and there's certainly no formulas for success. But the closest to all that I aforementioned is through a mentorship and finding somebody that is where you would like to be later on in life, or actually right now in life. Now, these are the characteristics that I found in mentors that have to exist. One, significantly more wealthy than you. For this audience, that's not too damn hard now, is it? I mean, we could find somebody on the next lorry. Two, significantly more experienced than you. A senior person usually that you really like and respect. Now, they don't, only ha they don't always have to be older, as the next comment, or number three says. But the reason why you have to really like them and respect them is because you're going to have to deal with them and do stuff with them that's outside of business. And that relates to four, something else in common outside the field of your business, golf, fishing, etc. Mr. Grazos, we had in common, we loved good food and good drink. And I still remember telling his seventh wife, for real, his seventh wife, Costa smells like liquor. Oh, no, no, he must have been standing too close to me. I mean, because he wasn't drinking. He, and uh, the, uh, Jim Newman and I had tennis, and Jerry Orman and I had golf, have golf still today. But we had something else in common that we could enjoy together and not spend every minute um, talking business. Because your mentor doesn't want you, like, putting a hoover to his ear or her ear, and sucking all the knowledge out in 15, 20, or 45 minutes, or an hour. They want to deal with you as a, as a human being, and they want to relate to you and your problems and all the other things. I still remember been there, done that, when I was in really financial trouble, when I had my, all my assets in a, a lawsuit in 1992. They put a what's called a constructive trust in America, around all my assets for 19 months, which really essentially meant I couldn't write a check for 19 months, and my personal overhead is staggering. And I went to play golf at Bel Air Country Club with Jerry Orman, and there was three Fortune 500 retired chief executives there. Bel Air Country Club has uh, the novelty of having more retired Fortune 500 chief executives as members of any country club in the United States. So we're 
and I used to be a real good golfer, and I, I couldn't get the ball off the tee barely. So we got in the cart, and we went around, and after nine holes, we stopped in to have a drink and something to eat, and so they said, um, I told them what had happened. They just froze all my assets, and all the chief executives retired said at the same time, almost in concert, oh, it's going to get a lot worse. And I said, God, help me. It can't get any worse than this. And sure as hell, boy, were they right. It got a lot worse. The moron lady judge, Elizabeth Ray, I still remember, uh, she decided that there was a chance that I did all these bad things, so she made it even tougher on me. And we went through a seven-week trial. It was just gut-wrenching seven-week trial, which I won, all 32 counts. And, uh, but it got a lot worse. But the fact that they could relate that to me. And so when it got a lot worse, I didn't like it. It didn't make me feel good, but at least I was prepared for it. And much of dealing with great problems and anxiety is preparation. Being mentally prepared. Grazos to me, gave me courage in battle, friendship in trouble, and wisdom in rage. The third one was the one he worked with me the most because I didn't need courage in battle very much and I wasn't much interested in friendship and trouble, but I was a pretty crazy young man and he gave me wisdom, the insight of the various vignettes he would go through dating back from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s with Mr. Onassis. So I thank him for that amongst other things. Before you even ask me why I won't be your mentor, that's not the business I'm in. Um, there are plenty of people in this country uh, that can be uh, uh, your mentor. Um, the, um, I have as many mentees as I can handle now, uh, and, uh, but it's, it's not that difficult. Uh, one of the things I do is I deal with uh, you know, many retired chief executives uh, here in Britain and in other places in the world. Nobody calls them. Nobody calls them. Key number nine. Somehow, some way, you've got to overcome fear, and particularly, specifically in this country, the fear of failure. I was working on a transaction, and a fear is false expectations appearing real. How many times have we seen something, we think we see something in the dark, and there's nothing really there? How many times have we worried about a problem, made it so anxious, it give us, it's given us an upset stomach, and then when the thing really happens, it's not anywhere near as bad as we thought it was? Fear is good. It sharpens, as we'll see in a slide or two from here. It sharpens our, um, our senses. It's a resource. It helps us find the edge of our capacities. Going back to the primal time when we came out of caves... I mean, we had primal instincts. We saw a big animal, and we either, it was fight or flight. I mean, we sense these things. We still have these primal instincts, but we don't use them anymore. And especially societies like exist in Europe that have been around a lot longer than America, you use them even less. The reason you don't rule two-thirds of the world anymore is because you don't use your primal instincts. Back in the days of the empire, did Britain give a damn what anybody thought? I don't think so. They just did what they felt like was right. And as Betty Bender said, a German philosopher, anything I've ever done that ultimately was worthwhile initially scared me to death. You've got to remember that. I know the first president I ever met was President um, Nixon. I was apprehensive. This is before all this stuff happened to him. By the time I met Clinton... It was like um, money for old rope, or is that, isn't that right? Isn't there a saying? I mean, it was nothing. It was like, you know, and then after I talked to him, it was even less impressive. <laughs> this is not, I am not preaching about taking a big chance. I'm talking about giving yourself a big chance. Because nobody's going to do this for you but you. Not your significant other, not your children, not your grandparents, not your business partners, not your colleagues. And to get over this fear, and, and anxiety is fear's little brother, only you can make yourself anxious. Fear and anxiety are self-induced. And if you're not experiencing anxiety or discomfort, the risk you 
think you're taking probably is not worthy of you. The last time most of you were anxious or had anxiety in your business was when you first started it, as I said in my opening remarks. That's a long time ago from the look of some of you in the audience. Long time ago. A long, long time ago. And if you don't understand this precept, any problem solved will immediately be replaced by a larger and more complicated one. If you're in the process of making a quantum leap, then you don't understand business. Remember when you first opened up and you first started and you worked around the clock and you did whatever it takes and problems just came out of the walls, but you somehow survived, you somehow dealt with them. What happened? What happened? Same person, you're just older. A little more lazy, a little more satiated. And if you don't understand progress, often masquerades as um, trouble. When somebody tells me his business is running smoothly, I know he's dying. I don't want to hear. Do you think Microsoft is running smoothly? I don't think so. Do you think Nike, under Phil Knight's leadership, is running smoothly? I don't think so. Do you think Richard Branson, the Virgin Group, is running smoothly? I don't think so. No organization in the growth phase is running smoothly. The road to success is always under construction. And as Walter Riston, my old banker, the former chief executive of Citibank, used to tell me, all of life is the management of risk, Dan, not the elimination of it. To the extent that you're capable or able to eliminate risk from your business equation means, by definition, you're not growing. It's the management of that risk, not the elimination of it. Now, one of my very dear friends, Pete Conrad, just passed away, the third man to walk on the moon. And um, as a little sidebar comment, he was sitting in my house in California with my children, explaining to him, explaining to my sons what it looked like, what it was like to be on the moon and look back at Earth. And it inspired my two sons, and they both went to the NASA space camp shortly thereafter, and his wife um, was saying that, you know, Petey had, as he was called, had uh, the two qualifications to be an astronaut. So I'm expecting, you know, some academic stuff. And he says, yeah, Juan, he was a midget. And he says, not much bigger than the monkeys they used to send up so he could fit in the capsule. I'm thinking to myself, God almighty, well, what's number two going to be? And number two, he was fearless. He didn't care. The monkeys didn't know they could die. And he was a fearless test pilot to push the edges of the envelope and didn't care. He was setting world records up until the time he died. And he died riding a motorcycle 25 miles an hour with a group of friends. They were on a trip from uh, Orange County, or not Orange County, uh, San Fernando Valley to Santa Barbara to have lunch and drive back. He slipped in gravel. The bike went off on its side, very similar to the injuries that I had on a, uh, a dune buggy in Mexico five months ago. And he died. Now, when he went to the moon, and when we send rockets to the moon, they're off course 95% of the time, but we continue to readjust, 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 until we are there. Business is no different. Business is like life. It's not static. How many times have we readjusted our thought process vis-a-vis -vis business, being a high-performance person? Now, when people have low self-esteem, they protect themselves by not taking risks. When they have high self-esteem, you take all the chances that you can get a hold of. You know how you get a project done? You give it to a busy person. I can't tell you how many times I've been in boardrooms here in this country and all over the world, and I know from listening to the directors, or I know when the presentations are being made by the level, one or two levels below directorship, they come in and they're projects to be, to, to be handed out and the extra responsibilities. The people that are on the fast track can't get enough responsibility, can't get enough authority. And the people that are satiated, oh, well, I, well, I have a full plate. 
There's a lot of full plates in Britain, and that's going to be the problem going into the new millennium. Because there's other parts of Europe that they don't have full plates, even if they are full. Now, there's three practical ways to overcome fear and emotional turmoil. You're, some of you may not think they're so practical. One, and this is the easiest. Find somebody that's been there, done that. He or she will have been a far worse scrapes than you have ever been in. And they can help you achieve a sense of perspective for your problems. When something catastrophic happens or something that you think is catastrophic, you think and you act like you're the only one this has ever happened to. Well, that's baloney because that's not true. A problem shared is a problem halved. And I'm not talking about sharing doubts with employees or moaning to losers. I'm talking about with your mentor. You don't share doubts, and we're going to cover that in a minute. Two, fear reduction technique two. Know categorically the following. That which does not kill me makes me stronger. Nietzsche. Now, I just gave uh, parts of this presentation to a group up in my home, Guthrie Castle, and there was one German, very successful publisher, and he noticed, or we all noticed, that about two-thirds of the examples I use are all Germans. Now, I never looked at it that way. And there's another name that's used for Germans in this country, which I'm not going to say here because we're taping this. But um, if it doesn't kill you, by definition, it makes you stronger. How many are willing to fill and go in and fill that breach. I got to be a world-class public speaker only one way, ladies and gentlemen. I made a hell of a lot of bad speeches. I made two, over 200 speeches in 1972. From Bangor, Maine to Miami, from San Diego to Seattle, Washington. Boy, those first 100 to 150 were just abysmal. By the time 180, 190, 2, 210, 220, boy, I was a public speaking SOB. Boy, I could, I could talk. About anything. But I made a lot of bad speeches. I did it poorly until I did it well. And number three, fear reduction technique. Deliberately push the envelope of your abilities. Place yourself in risky situations. Put yourself in harm's way. And I mean that literally. Put your, you put yourself in harm's way and you get good. Or as a couple of my friends say, you, you either get good or you get dead. Now, here I am with Crocodile Dundee, and unfortunately, Crocodile Dundee is no longer with us. This is the real Crocodile Dundee, a guy named Barry Leeds. Thank you. And we were hunting crocodiles here. Now, as I said to him, as we're going along there, I said, now how do we get the weapon down? Uh, I, was asked, I was trying to be too logical about this. And, um, the, uh, but I learned how you get the weapon down. Because if you didn't get the weapon down in time, you got your uh, bitten off. So, I mean, I learned the hard way. Now, it's, it's, it's quite a, it, interesting. If no one ever took risks, Michelangelo would have painted the Sistine floor. That was a risky deal back in those days. And I'm sure some of the things that you haven't done have been because of the risks involved. Or the perceived risks. Other risky things I've done, skydiving, which wasn't such a big thrill to me. Hunting pumas in dark caves is, is an adrenaline rush that's beyond comparison. I hunt wild boars with knives, and I have a, 27 stitches across here where a wild boar in um, Argentina tried to eat my... Is it spleen on this side, Doc? Yeah. Um, and uh, recently, almost killing myself in a sand dune buggy in Cabo San Lucas, Baja, Mexico with my two sons which I'm, I'm going to have to do this coming Easter because i got to do it again because I almost killed myself the last time. But, um, and God's not going to look for medals or degrees or diplomas when you come to make your maker, meet your maker. He's going to look for scars, and i got plenty of them. And some of those scars, ladies and gentlemen, are going to be emotional scars. And emotional scar tissue is a lot more difficult to get over than real scar tissue. And that's why when we talk about the emotional bank account and the financial bank account, the emotional bank account is infinitely more important. I've already talked about Sophie's Choice. More importantly, nothing that you're ever going to decide is going to be more in the cosmos of time than a, a fart in the wind. I mean, nothing, nothing that you do 
and yet you ponder it. Peter Drucker, the famous management consultant, he's in his late 80s now, he's written 35 or 40 books. He and I agree on three things in his most recent book about the 21st century. Number one, he says, the university system as we know it today is irreversibly down the pan. I agree. Okay. Number two, the PC, the computer, the personal computer is the worst thing that ever happened to the entrepreneur. If you remember, for those of us that are old enough, the computer back in whenever they invented it, the 30s or 40s, was invented to assimilate and gather information, not make decisions. Just gather information. And now we use it to make decisions. Financial calculations, it would take weeks or months before we can do in hours, sometimes minutes. It still takes us weeks and months to make decisions. Why? And number three, Mr. Drucker says, and I believe with all my heart, eventually in the new millennium, I'll be gone probably, he for sure will be gone, is that it's going to be the haves against the have-nots. The poor are going to rise up and try to take the money from the rich like me. And that's why I've trained my sons. And they're going to be on the embattlements at Guthrie with my arsenal that I have, stacking them up to the top 70 feet high, because if they're going to come and take my money, they better be prepared to spill their blood on my golf course out in front. The, ob the objective, to replace fear with passion. That should be your objective moving forward. And as my good partner Bruce Whipple would say, I'm increasing my risk and stretching my comfort zone on a daily basis. Risk doesn't scare me anymore. I have replaced fear with faith. I find the two emotions can't exist at the same time. And I agree, and I couldn't agree more. And for those of you, a couple of you have met Bruce. Bruce is my, um, for the lack of a better term, clean up hatchet man. He goes into business ventures that for whatever reason go wrong, and they always go wrong, and he fixes them. And that's what he does, and that's what he does very well. He looks at a problem, like if, if during the, the, the bombing of London during the war, He'd look at this, he'd be climbing over the debris with Churchill and say, God, what a great opportunity for an engineer here. Jeez, I can't believe. Look at all the stuff we've got to rebuild. I just look at all the damn rubble and God, what, with all the headaches. To him, the glass is always half full and not half empty. And by the way, if you're ever in business with me and you see Whipple walk in the door, it's because you're walking out the door. Just remember that. It's because you're exiting. Because he doesn't come along to pass you on the bum and say, what a good job you're doing. He's there to cut your heat off. Key number 10. Practicing being super successful, successful even when you're not. What do I mean by that? Well, it's like I practiced meeting, being presented as it's called to the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh many, many, many times for many years before I ever was presented. I... Practice in my own mind. What would I do? What would I say? Um, etc., etc. I practiced when I was brought into my university where I finally graduated from uh, as the most successful alumni in the history of the school. I, and I, when I addressed the graduation class, this was 1990, um, I said, I've been here before. This is deja vu for me. And then I said under my breath, it's about time you finally call me back. I should have been called back 10 years before. But I practiced these things because I mentally am prepared because these are part of my goal systems. These are part of my dreams, part of my passions. When was the last time you practiced? I know the answer. Now, we've talked about comfort zone. And by the way, Jim Newman is the originator of the comfort zone concept when he was at IBM with Ross Perot, I might add. One's image of the way things are supposed to be. That's our comfort zone. My father takes a vacation late July through early September every year. He goes to his condominium in Maui. My birthday is August 10th, so he's missed my 20th, 30th, 40th, 50th, and if he lives long enough, 60th and 70th birthday. He'll never be there because it's out of his comfort zone. He is convinced Maui, the only time to go to Maui is the 25th of July through the 6th of September. How many of you take your holidays the same time frame every year after year after year? 
Most of you. Now, this is my discomfort zone definition. Feeling ill at ease and out of your normal element or believing a situation to be uncomfortable, having never really experienced it. Most of you can't get up here and speak like I do. Not, no, well, first of all, none of you can. But I mean, most of you can't even get up here and speak. Most of you would be apprehensive doing some of the things that other people feel very comfortable. And I'm not talking about high wires. Uh, I'm just talking about regular, everyday things. Now, super discomfort zone, which is beyond just just comfort zone, is being uncomfortable and filled with dread almost beyond your comprehension. For most people, public speaking or life-threatening activities. One of the reasons I do life-threatening activities is because they expand my comfort zone. I've done, been involved in over 700 business transactions. And the life is about continuing to expand your comfort zone until you die. When you stop expanding your comfort zone is when you stop using your mind, you stop developing the, 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 the primal instincts that we have, and then what's the next step? Horizontal to the ground, deed, as they say in Scotland. They say a lot of other things in Scotland. Courage is not the absence of fear, it's proceeding in spite of those feelings. Now, I get apprehensive. I get nervous. I was nervous. Um, and you can tell, if anybody has followed me around, I was in uh, Fiji a year ago, January or February, making a speech. To, I, as I found out, 600 or 700 right-wing, neo-Nazi, fascist, pay no, I mean, crazy people. I filled in for somebody. God knows how I got, but anyway, I filled in. And uh, I said my first couple of jokes, the first opening remarks, and nobody laughed. So I turned, and I'm... My glass of water, I take a long time drinking the glass of water. I go, geez, what, what's going on here? I don't understand. So then I went back and I revisited it. And then I said, we, there must be a, a, a language problem here. We must not be speaking the same language. And I finally got him going and then the rest was great. And we went on the rest of the day. And, uh, but uh, my mouth dried up. My mouth hasn't dried up in a long, long time. And, uh, the, um, but I still can get anxious. But it takes a whole heck of a lot to get me anxious now. I can't remember the last time. Of the, of the people in the audience, I've, sh I've shook the hands of maybe 12 or 15 people. All but three, their hands were wet. Now, either they just peed on themselves or they were anxious. And I look for that, and we're going to talk about that after lunch. Barry Diller. Barry Diller, the founder of... Fox Network, the major fourth network in America, um, Viacom, and amongst others. Barry says it differently. He's talking about discomfort or comfort zone. Failure is hard, but you know what? This is a billionaire. There are real payoffs if you can figure out how to get over the fear of it, how to live with it, and ultimately how to push ahead. Now, that seems pretty simple, doesn't it? But... It's like when the first day of school, when you were there and you were nervous because it was a new environment. It's like my son being the first week of university and showing up in all his classes being full and he's been going to posh private schools all his life where they give you the classes. He was uncomfortable. We've experienced it in different areas of our life and we've expanded it. We've been forced to expand our comfort zone as we've grown up. But once you get to be adults, nobody's there to force you to expand your comfort zone anymore. And that's a problem. Your mentor will, though. Now, here are a few suggestions of things that you should do. One, for example, take a limo to the airport next time you fly. I've been with people recently, the former president of the YPO organization, which stands for Young Presidents Organization in America. We went out to dinner uh, with one of my young mentees because I wanted uh, her to be a member of the, she wanted to be a member of the YPO. So uh, he was a neighbor of mine uh, in California. We get in the rolls and we're driving to the restaurant. And this is, I'm not lying about this. He goes, this is the first time. Now this is a guy that's formerly managing director of three of the biggest advertising companies, agencies in the world. He said, this is the first time I've been in a Rolls Royce. I look in the rearview mirror and I look at her back there. And she goes, why are we with this moron? She's saying to me. Second thing he says, smells like leather. Oh, it gets better. It gets much better. And I look in the rearview mirror again. I look at her. She's going, 
She goes, turn around, let's go back. And then she says, and then, he, then, he, then he puts his greasy, sweaty palm, and she says, is this real wood? And then I knew it was a big mistake us having this dinner. We got to the restaurant. First of all, my mentee and I were dressed just like this. In fact, she has a little pocket chain, a little one with a little miniature, a little watch. And he was wearing a golf shirt and a sports coat. This guy, I never saw any human being eat, go through a five-course meal faster than he did. And he couldn't get back and, and, and get in his car and drive away fast enough because he was clearly out of his comfort zone. Clearly. Clearly. Okay. Now, you remember, for those of you that have written, or not written, read Napoleon Hill, you know, he visualized his first Rolls Royce when he was seven years old as a poor farm boy in Tennessee. Hire yourself good lawyers, good accountants. Not your brother-in-law. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be Slaughter and May or Freshfields or Allen and Overy. But I mean, ones that are going to give you proper advice. You'll feel out of your comfort zone because you're going to know what... First question you'll ask is how much an hour they charge. That's a question I never ask. Now, this is, this is really important. Now, my tailor, ladies and gentlemen, is the tailor to the Queen of England. His name is John Kent. He makes most of the suits for the royal family. I, I could tell you some stories about the queen and when she gets fitted for clothes, but that's not proper. And there's only two people in the, in the world I won't slag off. Three, really. The queen, the queen mom, and the pope. That's it. It's a very small, tight-knit group. Okay. But I bought, buy several world clothes um, and way before I could afford them. You only have one time to make its first impression. And I can't emphasize enough. It's like me showing up to a meeting and you're going to play golf later in the afternoon. You're wearing golf clothes and I came in dressed like this at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning. You never get done apologizing for how you look, even though you stop saying the first few minutes, the conversation, oh, I, I didn't realize, blah, 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 blah. And, but you never really get the leverage back in the meeting. You don't. You don't. And I've proven this time and time again, sending 25, 26-year-old kids against 45, 50-year-old mature businessmen, and the kids eat them alive. I can't emphasize enough that the day of the ponytail, the earring, will never be seen in the city at the board level. I don't care. 500 years from now. You want to be taken seriously. It's like I took over a company in Florida a few years ago. It's always hot. People wear sports shirts, casual. I don't care if it's, it's 60 degrees Celsius. We, we, we change, not in written policy, but the, uh, um, dress policy. And slowly but surely, productivity went up. Expense accounts went down. It was, it was a dramatic turnaround. This year, revenue turnover is up 50% since January. Because you start to think about yourself more positively. It's like the former chairman and chief executive of Fibro, who bought Solomon Brothers a number of years ago, the big uh, commodity trading house, he told me, he says, Mr. Pena, just remember, think Yiddish and dress British. And he was referring to, you know, the proper city dress. Now, if you notice in the city... Have you ever been to a meeting, and I know the answer to this, where you haven't seen the person in a dark suit? The answer is no. Have you ever seen a pair of brown shoes? The answer is no. Have you ever seen a pair of white socks? The answer is no. Unfortunately, have you ever seen too many females at the board level? The answer is no. And I can go on with the further discrimination. Will it ever change? The answer is categorically no. And if you're going to compete at that level or anywhere near that level, you better know that and better realize it. Of course, you have the choice to not compete at that level. Book a table at the best restaurant. When we were children, when I was a young man, before I married my wife, she was my girlfriend, we used to go to La Quinta Country Club in, in uh, Palm Springs. Um, um, Sammy Davis Jr., Frank Sinatra, and uh, Bob Hope all were members, and I used to sit in, in the men's grill. It cost us $215 a night to stay. This was in the early 70s. Our flat that we had was $205 a month. 
And we'd go down there and we'd stay and uh, for one night a month. And then that's when I decided I needed a Rolls Royce and I bought a Rolls Royce when I was just before my 25th birthday. And I've had Rolls for th 30 years, yeah, almost 30 years. So, you know, my kids think everybody drives around in Bentleys and Rolls. They don't know any different. That's their comfort zone. My son had a big tr problem because he couldn't sign up for classes because there wasn't somebody there to sign him up. Now he's learned. He's going to class on Friday and Saturday, which knocks the hell out of his party life, which I think is a good deal. I would have paid money for that. Take a weekend, as I told you. Join a good club. Join the best club. You cannot afford. And I was, I was poking fun at the Reform Club, 1832. I can give you the story about it because I've been there a lot. Um, first time I was there, I said, reform of what? <laughs> Mr. Pena. And then he went through the, the history of the Reform Club, etc., etc. It's like the first time I ate at the House of Commons, the House of Lords. I enjoyed that, but now it's not such a big deal. I think it's quite interesting that the House of, is it the House of Commons, they won't let the people from the House of Lords in the House of Commons, right, in the chambers. They make them stand by some little rail like a dog. I thought that was quite interesting. But I really, I know who runs the country now. When I first came over here, I didn't understand the, the pecking order of, uh, of politics. Now, when you think about getting tired, what happens? You get tired. Well, conversely, ladies and gentlemen, when you think about getting rich and that's all you think about, guess what? You get rich. There was a 10-year period of time in my life, all I thought about, from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed, as my wife would attest to, much to her chagrin many times, I was thinking about business. When my friends would come and visit me up at Guthrie, I'd have a meal with them, a drink, and then I'd go back to the office and work. They'd go out and play golf. I'd be, stay at the office and work. You don't have the fastest growing natural resource company five years in a row because you're taking holidays. You don't grow at 67,000% per year for eight years in a row or over a half a billion percent because you're taking holidays. If I had been in the computer business, the pundits say, and I shudder to say this, I would have been worth 50 to 100 billion dollars. Because I was in a collapsing industry. I am now in the internet business. Because I got one more big bang in me before they put ground on me. And yet, this is where I live. And the reason the Castle Experience is so important to some of you, it would be, is because it pushes your comfort zone. And it helps you practice to see how the other high-performance people react. And the first time you sit down to dinner there in the big uh, formal dining room, Everybody's nervous. I don't care who you are. And you got ten pieces of silverware going this way and six going this way. And even though I always tell everybody, go ahead, eat, start without me. Nobody to this day has ever picked up a goddamn fork or a spoon or anything. Because even though we know it starts out and works in and moves down, you're not really sure. You're really not sure. I don't care your public school training, whatever. You're really not dead positive, and you're not willing to commit a gaffe, a faux pas. It's an interesting experiment. Ted Nicholas, Stewart's and I, a good friend, he's, he's, he said, Dan, why don't you make it a learning exercise instead of an uh, uh, ass-puckering exercise, and why don't you go through it? But I still like it to be an ass-puckering exercise, so I like it that way. I like it that way. And nobody's ever picked up the bell to ring for the... For nobody. I think that they just sit there waiting for the second course forever. Nobody's going to pick up that bell even when I'm not there. Because they're not sure whether you ring it twice, once, or ten times. They're not sure whether they, you stick it up your bum. They don't know what the hell the story is. Key number 11. Perception is reality. Now... I've said this, but it's worth repeating. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been to a lot of seminars, you've heard a lot of speakers. 
Some of you have heard me before, and that's why you're back. Some of you aren't back because you've heard me before. High-performance people understand you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. When it's dealing from your local bank manager to your solicitor to your potential joint venture partner to whatever it is, you don't get a second chance. And the way you come across and the way you dress and the way you're prepared is extremely important. I, I, I can't tell you enough. I mean, when I first met Mr. Grazos or uh, Walter Riston, the former head of Citicorp, or I met the, uh, a managing partner of um, uh, Timothy Retallick of Freshfields the first time, I mean, I only got one chance. And in those days, Freshfields interviewed you and you needed three recommendations from existing clients to become a new, a new client. They used to say, and they still do, we represent the Queen of England, the Bank of England, and the Church of England. And then I would add, and Dan Pena, and not necessarily that order, actually. And can you just imagine in the early 80s having some wise, cocky, American, didn't look that great then, um, sitting with the, the number one guy in the note paper for Freshfields? I had some Freshfield partners came over and had lunch with me about a year and a half ago and said, Timothy gives, sends his best. Could you tell us some stories about how you used to give Timothy a bad time? Because these guys wouldn't even, they called him Mr. Retallick, not Timothy. So I shared some of my intimate stories about him. He was a great guy. And a lot of what I've been able to accomplish since then is because of his representation and the fact that Freshfields took me on. They made a mistake and they took me on. Key number 12. I've already talked about this. Play to win. Don't play not to lose. Most of you that have existing businesses that started from zero turnover and have grown up to 50, 100, 500, a million in turnover, you experienced quantum growth when you first started your business, but now you're playing not to lose because you're fearful what people will think. Perhaps you got lucky and you try to hang on to the assets that you have. You covet your assets. I call it sitting on your assets. And this country is not the only country that does that. It's all over the world. This is known in gambling as playing with scared money. I can smell scared money. Just like of the 12 or 15 people that I shook hands with, three quarters of them had moisture in their hand. And it isn't because the room's hot. You're not under the lights like me. How many times in sports or athletics have you seen a team take an early lead, then settle into coveting their lead or sitting on their assets, playing not to lose, only to be beaten in the last minutes or in overtime, etc. That's what most of you have been taught to do in your life. We had a gentleman that uh, came to the Castle Seminar uh, a week ago um, who he's an heir to a 100-year-old steel dynasty in Kenya. And he says the 280 relatives are only just sucking the dynasty dry Nobody's grown the thing since my great-grandfather at the turn of the century. Because you cannot jump a chasm in two leaps. The ones that try to jump in two leaps, you, you wind jumping on Dunkirk or something. When I use the Dunkirk analogy or metaphor, nobody understands other than in this country. You either do it or you don't do it. You're either pregnant or you're not. You're either in business or you're not. Q13. Now, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt that you all have a dream. And the reason why you plan more time around your holidays, for your holidays, is because you're probably not working in your dream. You're not passionate about what you do. And as a song from South Pacific says, if you don't have a dream, then how can you have or make a dream come true? I have taken my passion and wrapped my new profession around it. I enjoy what I do infinitely more than anybody in the audience vis-a-vis -vis what they do. And it should be pretty obvious. Blessed are those, was he English, actually? Blessed are those who expect nothing, for they shall not be disappointed. I think he was, actually. 
I think he was a seminar guru in the first part of the century. Yes. I think he's a sixth generation Etonian. How important is it to have a dream? I mean, these are words, but I mean, I, it's, it's not calculable. If you do not have a dream, you must, must either get one or abandon all thoughts of being a high-performance person because you will not spend the time, you will not be able to stay committed and show the discipline that's necessary unless you love what you do. You just won't. Full stop. Started with someone's dream. When I think of that now, when I see that, I think of Pete Conrad now. And dreams must come a size too big for us to grow into them. They must. I can remember vividly the things that I've accomplished. Um, that st- that virtually all of them started with a dream from my estate in Scotland. I could see my kids and the governesses and nannies playing on the tennis courts. I thought we were going to have two courts. We only have one. And I could see all these things that, are, that have happened in my life. The estate I have in California overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you know, I could see the whales, you know. And, and all that has come to fruition. My biggest problem, as I already said, is I accomplished everything I ever wanted to by the time I was 39. I didn't set my goals high enough. And as my friend Donald Trump would say, you've got to think anyway, so why not think big? And the rest of that sentence is, because it burns the same calories. By the way, thinking small and big burns the same calories, which was novel to Donald. Smart guy, though. Super smart guy. Tom Jefferson. Now, by the way, if you follow American history, now he's no good. Father of the United States is no good. He, he fathered kids from slaves. He did all this stuff. Now he's no damn good. Um, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. Father of, uh, uh, of the United States, one of them, along with George Washington and a couple others. Um, one of the measurements, by the way, when I go into an organization to look at it from a consulting point of view, to talk to the directors, do they have more memories than dreams? If they got more memories than dreams, they're out of there. How would you be judged? A committee cannot, oh, this is a bright man, this is a world class philosopher. A committee cannot dream. Dreams are for individuals to have and for committees to execute. Stuart Goldsmith. Great newsletter writer of the planet. And Prince Among Men, Renaissance Man, Reconteur, Bon Vivant. I can't say enough. Also the publisher of my new book. <laughs> It's another way. It doesn't take any more effort to dream big than it does dream small. But remember, big dreams, big problems, big rewards. Everybody forgets the big problems. My problems compared to your petty-ass problems, yours don't pale in complexion. I mean, they're not even on the same continuum. For those of you that understand statistics, I mean... You're like in the first standard, you are the mean, and I'm in the hundredth standard deviation from the mean. I mean, I'm, I'm not even in the same planet. Because when you have big rewards, you have to have big problems. Bill Gates has big problems right now. The Justice Department's trying to take his dynasty apart. It's 50 50 whether he's going to win. They say that he should have cut a deal by now because now the Justice Department has too much to lose to let him off the hook. We'll see. We'll see. But he's got mammoth problems. And I learned many, many years ago, as have my mentors coached me, life's too short not to follow our dreams. I'm 54 years old. I still have the energy uh, that I had when I was 30. In some respects, I have greater energy. Um, I still enjoy what I do. I love what I do. I still travel, you know, 15, 20,000 miles a month. I'm on planes. Fortunately, I don't suffer from jet lag because you know why? I've decided that I couldn't suffer from jet lag about 20 years ago. 
Because you can't travel as much as I do if you suffer from jet lag. You're just screwed. So I don't suffer from jet lag. For those of that, are, that, that, that understand that from an emotional point of view or from a, a medical point of view, I mean, I just don't. Every entrepreneur has to take a leap of faith and pursue his or her dream. I'm living proof. Howard Schultz, founder of Starbucks. By the way, they all told him that his idea, nobody's ever going to pay for coffee. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. The world's flat. Uh, I mean, you can't, you can't have, you know, everybody that has ever done anything against conventional wisdom that made meaningful change on this planet was told that he was full, he or she was crazy and full of crap. No exception. None. And if you go out and start practicing some of these precepts, you will be told the exact same thing. And that, my friends, is the reason that most of you will not. Full stop. Because you do care what your neighbor, your colleague, your relative thinks about you. They're bringing me them faster than I can drink them today. Thank you, though. Um, I said this earlier on. I mean, my life was changed dramatically when I, I, I understood what Ted Turner said about your um, having goals that transcend your lifetime. I mean, um, I, can't, I can't emphasize enough because it changes, it shifts your whole way of thinking. It sh- I mean, it, I, that's, that's too simple. It's more than that. It shifts your whole way of living, of being, when you have things that are going to transcend your lifetime. Now, when I went into the coaching business, I tried to distill my thought process down to as few uh, principles as possible. I came up, these are my five credos for success. Um, I live by them, and um, they're quite simple. Number one, yesterday's dreams are today's realities, or today's dreams are tomorrow's realities. The example I use of my dream coming to fruition, and it's the perfect metaphor for this, is, is, is Guthrie and how I live now, which was my dream. I came from a house that was 880 square feet. If you can believe that, that's um, roughly, um, let's see, is that 25 by, well, there it is, anyway. 880 square feet isn't very big. And, um, and so for me to dream the impossible dream, number two, seeing dreams ahead of time now. And that means, if I was a young man, like there's a few young people in the audience, 30 years old, and I had a goal to be whatever, I'd see myself there now as I look at as a 30-year-old. I don't, even though in, intellectually I understand that she's going to maybe take me five or ten years or whatever the time frame, you don't see yourself there when you think everybody else thinks you're going to be there. You see yourself there in time now. I'm going to be managing director of XYZ company, whatever. And right now I'm a clerk. And I'm 23 years old. I see myself there now. Not as I might be when I'm 45 years old. Number three, simulation. Practice within when you're without. I've talked about that. Virtually all the major events that I've been a part of, I've practiced for years before I ever actually did them. So when I did them and I was living that dream, it was deja vu. It was like I had already been there. I had already been there. All the great speeches I've made, all the super high-performance successful people that I've had the privilege of meeting... I practiced in my own mind before I was there. Number four, and this has never really been a problem for me, is act as if I have no limits to my uh, abilities. Um, There's nothing I can't do. Um, And um, I know intellectually I've got to stay focused, I've got to stay determined, but but, but, I mean, act as if there were no limits to our abilities. When we were building Great Western Resources, and I was asked by the Financial Times, the energy editor, or whatever the hell he, he was called at the time, well, how is it that uh, you've grown significantly when everybody else is going out of business? And, and I said, I was being a smart ass when I said it, but I said, well, actually, and I've given my British accent, actually, we decided not to participate in the energy recession. 
<laughs> and we acted as if we had no limits to our abilities, and we would have been highly surprised if we hadn't been the number one, country, or number one company on the planet. But it's the truth. Even though I was taking the piss out of him when I was saying it, little twit making 14 grand a year, asking me, I still get irritated thinking about it. <laughs> you know? I spend more on shoes a year than he makes a year. Little twit. Anyway, um, and number five, another one I've never had a problem with, is enthusiasm. I've never met a high-performance person that wasn't super enthusiastic. Never. And enthusiasm comes from the Greek word God from within. Very simple. And I repeat those, and I used to say them every morning and every night as affirmations. Now I, I, now I say them, uh, you know, a couple times a month, and I read them, and I copy them in my diary every month. But these are the things I live by. And my children call this the five credo crap. Because they've been hearing these since they were in their mommy's tummy. My, my, my oldest son can give this talk. I'm not just about this, the whole seminar. I mean, and, you know, and, uh, the, uh, because they live it. And he says it's very difficult. When I go to Cabo San Lucas every Easter, notwithstanding I almost killed myself this last Easter, we spend the two sons and myself, we spend time together, you know, bond or whatever you want to call it. And we say, I let them drink and we sit around talking. And then they keep on telling me how hard it is to be my son. No matter what we do, no matter who we meet, no matter, I mean, Dad, we're going to be compared to you. And I said, no, no, and that's, you don't have to be me to be a high-performance person. There's the Henry Kissinger into the continuum, and there's Norman Schwarzkopf and Dan Pena into the continuum. Most high-performance people, ladies and gentlemen, are at this end of the continuum, not at mine. Remember that. So don't use this as a cop-out why you don't do this. I can't be a Dan Pena. Thank God, as my wife would say. What if the world was filled with just Dan Pena's? And I think, my God, I, that's actually a grand idea. I like that. <laughs> Nobody loves me more than me. And that's another thing. Self-esteem, all the high-performance people have it. And the bedrock of excellence in life is self-esteem. And if you haven't figured that out yet, then you better go to some other slappy, happy seminars. Key number 14, you must have passion. All high-performance people are passionate, enthusiastic. If I'm nothing else, I'm enthusiastic and I'm passionate. And I've sold a lot of transactions just on my passion. And maybe the numbers didn't stack up as well as they should have. But I've sold them on my passion. I did a rights issue many years ago, Bearings, before Bearings went kaput. Lord Bearing was in the audience and he said, I give the presentation, he's walking me to the lift. Very proper. America, nobody walks you to the lift, the elevator. I mean, you know, you get there yourself. And we're strolling along. And, he, and I said, Lord Barry, how is it that I could have made my presentation more, more succinct, better? And, he, and as the, elevator, the lift uh, doors are closing like this, he leans into the elevator like a helper Hitchcock movie. He leans forward to me and says, learn to stutter. And he backs up and thing goes like this. So I'm th he was saying I was too slick. Okay. I five, six, seven months later, I'm back for another rights issue. Of course, I told him it's not our intention to have another rights issue for three or four years. I'm back six months later. So we start the presentation. Lord Barron's there, and a guy named Gunn, as I recall, was his chief investment officer. They're sitting there, and I start out by saying, Lord Barron, and everybody just burst into laughter, and they said, we take up our rights, let's go have lunch. And that was in the day with the big lunches. I mean, and, um, but I learned, and I still try to learn. And I wish Bearings was still around as Bearings. And people who never get carried away should be in a box. Enthusiasm will get you a long, long way in this world. A long, long way. Enthusiasm and good looks will get you longer, and enthusiasm, good looks, and brains will even get you longer. Our duty is to proceed as if we have no limits to our abilities. You know who said that? Charles Schwab. The biggest uh, discount broker in the world. One of the great deals. He sold his company for $106 million to Bank of America. Four years later, he bought it back for $8 million from Bank of America. And now it's worth, I don't know how many billion dollars. A very enthusiastic, oh, it is, okay. A very enthusiastic guy. Very bright guy, very charismatic guy.
you attack every problem with enthusiasm, as though you, your very life depended on it, you'll succeed. Why is it, now an American, I can only think of an American analogy. During the playoffs, no, I, no that's not true, I can think, uh, during the World Cup, etc., the level of play, the standard of play goes up. It just does. And they have a, a drill in American football, the two-minute drill. Why, why can they almost score at will in the two-minute drill at the end of two minutes of a, a football game um, when they can't during the regular part of the season? Because they're playing with more enthusiasm. They're playing as if it was the last two minutes of their last World Cup, their last Super Bowl. And you're going to have one strike at the ball to put it in the net, etc. If you lived every single day that way, you'd find that you'll be infinitely more successful. Now, the correct order is as follows. Find something you're passionate about and then wrap a career around it, which I've already said. See, most people do it the wrong way. And I'm, I'm sure that three quarters of the people in this room can relate to this. They start a business or launch into a career because they think it will make money or be successful, bring success. They try to force themselves to feel enthusiastic, passionate about their career or business. This doesn't work. The end result is despondency, lack of energy, and even depression. I used to ask the questions, how many are passionate about... This? I don't ask that anymore. Quite frankly, I don't care. Because you're going to lie to me anyway. There are many things in life which will catch your eye but only if you will catch your heart, pursue them. Pursue them. And I told my mother all the dogs I slept with as a, a young man, I, I was in love with. Now, good example of passion. I'm in the halal food business in, in um, the Netherlands. Make a long story short, a young man, a baker, been a baker 17 years, approaches me with an idea. We're in the Damstel Club, uh, the, the business club in, in Holland, which I'm an honorary member in Amsterdam, and he comes to me, he says, I've got an idea to make fast, not fast food, prepared food in, uh, in the supermarkets. Halal is like uh, kosher food, but it's for uh, Muslims. And I said, how many Muslims are in the world? He goes, 1.7 billion. I said, you sure about that? I said, 40% or plus, because it's just over 6 billion people now. I said, okay. And then I said, what's the margin on this food? Because I like big margin business. He says, the margin on this business, uh, food is between 40 and 95% profit. Hmm, okay. Third question. Who else does it? Nobody. I asked that question five times. Nobody. Then I called a friend of mine who's the former chief executive officer of Booker PLC, Charles Bowen. Charles, you ever heard of this halal food stuff? Yeah, for 20, 25 years people have been doing to do it. Has anybody done it now? Why? He says, I don't know. I says, you're absolutely positive. Yeah, Dan, I mean, yeah, I am. Thank you. That's all the due diligence I did. Full stop. 1998, the company was the innovative uh, uh, company of the year by the Economic Ministry of the Netherlands, and the CEO was nominated as CEO of the year, Entrepreneur of the Year, by the uh, European Economic, whatever the hell, for Europe, the new Europe. We have 30% of the market share already in the Netherlands, and we're negotiating with um, Tesco and, um, I want to say Sandsbury, maybe it is Sandsbury, I don't know, to um, sell half the company to. But he had a passion, but he couldn't find anybody to listen to him. That's how much due diligence. Doesn't, I didn't have to run any sums. Now you'd still be fiddle farting with the numbers. You'd be doing Lotus 1, 2, 3. Idiots like you. Key 15. You know, when in the old days, you remember the movie 10? Who the, what's the name of the woman? Bo Derek. Now when Bo Derek, excuse me ladies, because I don't have an analogy for the guys, for you. Now, when Bo Derek walk, was walking down the beach back in her prime, you didn't have to Lotus 1, 2, 3, to know she was hot, did you? Mm -mm. And if she's going, please, please, take me, take me. Now, guys, any red-blooded, even the, even the blue-blooded in the audience, I mean, it doesn't take us a long time to figure out what the right thing to do is. 
We don't have to load us one, two, three. And that's how I approach business. And that's how these other high performance people that I've talked about so far this morning approach business. Now, the final and most important key of the 15 keys is a high performance person is laser beam focused on success and he takes definitive action. Whether it's right or wrong, he realizes eventually it'll be right. There was a great article a couple years ago written about uh, Microsoft. Their, part of their mission statement is think it, do it, fix it. Think it, do it, fix it. They know they're going to screw it up, so they're going to have to fix it. And some of the stuff they've come out with, you can appreciate that for those of you that are in the industry. So we want you to get focused. Get absolutely laser beam focused. As Jack Nicholas says, I've never hit a shot, not even in practice, without having a very clear, in-focus picture of it in my own head. How many of you can say even a fraction of that? Probably none. Hank Aaron, who, was the home, who is the home run king, 754 home runs, I believe he's hit, I think what separates a superstar from the average ball player is the fact that he concentrates just a little bit more. Remember, we're talking about a marginal shift for a quantum difference. I think my work's a holiday. High performance people focus on the few, not the many. Some of you are involved in 10, 15, 20 projects and you wonder why none of them are successful. I can tell you why. Because you're involved in 10, 15, 20 projects. Involve yourself in one or two and then see what happens when you've shifted all your energy to one or two things, preferably one. It's been proven time and time again, you can only supervise properly two or three people. The secret to my success in building the fastest growing company five years in a row was I had two, maximum three people reporting to me. I still remember when we, we were big enough to have an IT officer, information, um, in, uh, what the hell is IT? Um, chief information officer. First of all, I didn't know what the hell that they did, but they wanted him to report to me. I said, bullshit, I don't want to report to me. One, I don't know what he does. Two, uh, find out where he should report, and he ultimately reported to the finance director, which I now find out is the right thing. Just like human resources, and we shove everything under the FD. He doesn't have enough to do anyway. Keep him away from doing sums. Focus is another word for discipline. How many of you can count yourself as a disciplined man or woman? Having lived here for 15 years, I know how many. All high performance people are disciplined. Even today, I still work 12 hours a day. When I'm home in California, I roll out of bed, 5, 5.30, I get on the phone to the UK, the Netherlands, Germany, and I'm there because of the sundown rule. I'm there 10, 11, watch 11 o'clock news, John, uh, Letterman, whatever he's called, uh, um, uh, and um, go to bed 12, 12, 30, 1 o'clock. I normally take a break for an hour, an hour and a half and go out and work out sometime during that day. It's no use saying I'm doing my best. You have, to, you have to got to succeed in doing what is necessary. Winston Churchill. This is the real Winston Churchill, the old one from the war. Because there's a new, there's a young one. Uh, grandson or something like that. We're talking about the original. And for anybody that knows anything about Churchill's history and all the stuff he did and the discipline and the youngest... Uh, well, war, not warlord, what the hell was he called? The Admiralty, whatever the hell he did. But anyway, and as Sean Connery would say, there's some vulgarities that are attached to this, but because we're cleaning our act up, they're out. But losers always whine about doing their best. There's a milkman, Edinburgh milkman, that's done all right. Half the women that are 40 or above said that they slept with Sean Connery in Edinburgh. He couldn't have delivered that much milk. Even his milk. Everybody's proud as hell of it. Motivation gets you started. Hopefully, a great many of you will take what you learn here today and it will be enough motivation for you to take your first step. Your first step. I mean that sincerely. Otherwise, I wouldn't be up here. 
By the way, Jim Ryan is the one that told me motivation gets me started, and we're going to get to another slide. Habits keep you going. The reason why you're not more successful, ladies and gentlemen, even for those of you that are motivated, motivated or have been motivated, is you have piss poor work habits. I can't make it any plainer than that. You got poor work habits. And as Jim Rohn, who said this, for those of you that are tree huggers, motivation alone is not enough. If you have an idiot and you motivate him, now you just got a, a motivated idiot. There's plenty of those walking around the city. I can assure you of that. You've got bad work habits. And uh, all the high-performance people I know have ex extraordinary work habits. Extraordinary. Myself included. It's the discipline at the turning point in my life when I got my head screwed on straight. And then we had to do a lot of screwing to get my head screwed on straight. Um, but ever since, I mean, I have and continue to have extraordinary discipline. I mean, I can do things that people shudder. Now, just imagine if you had all the money you ever needed. You could do whatever you wanted to do in life. And have done virtually everything there is to do. What would get you up every morning to work 12, minimum 12 hours a day for money that you don't need? What? My, my, my mother asks me that every time she talks to me. That's why I don't talk to her very often. Because I enjoy doing what I'm doing more than just sitting on all the money I've got. And I, where's some wood? Touch wood. I hope to God it never changes till the day I go. And if you associate with undisciplined people, you will become undisciplined. And for those, for a lot of you, you're not that disciplined to begin with. So I mean, it could be a death spiral. Now you don't have to be as disciplined as I am. I think it's important to understand that. I mean, you know, forget that walking on coals. And I mean, I've done all that. I mean, the discipline, it's Alistair Cook, the famous, uh, I don't know if he's a journalist, or, but he's, a, he's British, I know that. He said, you know, being a professional is doing a professional job and what you don't want to what you, what you do, or no, when you don't want to do it and still doing it. It's carrying on in a disciplined fashion, in a professional fashion, even when you don't feel like it. Every day that I get up to speak, I'm on the dais and the podium, I don't feel like doing it. Today happens to be one of those fortunate days for you because I, I like doing it today. But I've been, and I remember I had 104 temperature once in Chicago, and I, was, I had food poisoning, and I was dying. And I would have given somebody 10 million pounds to blow my brains out, and I was in a 16-hour workshop, and I struggled through it, and nobody knew the difference, and they were filming it just like they're filming it today. Having lost sight of the original purpose, actually, we've doubled our efforts. That's quite British, actually. This is not the thing to do. And after lunch, we're going to talk about structure, follow strategy. But action is the key. Action. Do you realize that this country is the only country that I know of that has a uh, equivalent of a takeover panel? And when you're in the takeover, you're buying the company, or you're, you can only talk to six people at a time. And then to talk to a seventh and drop one off, you've got to go back to the takeover panel. And I mean, no other place in the whole planet does, does that exist. Now, I don't know what it's a derivative of. Whatever it's a derivative is bad because it takes longer to do transactions. In America, you can talk to 6 million people at once, 500,000 lenders, venture capitalists. In this country, you can talk to six. And then you have to go with your hat in your hand and ask to add a seventh and drop one. There are risks and costs of a program of action, but they are far less than the long-range costs of comfortable inaction. John Kennedy, the former president, of the United States. You will weigh, as you leave here this evening, 
what the costs of doing what I've suggested are. Wrongfully. What you should weigh, ladies and gentlemen, is the costs, what are the costs of not doing what I suggest. And even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. Many of you understand intellectually what I've said so far today. A few of you even understand it emotionally. But if you sit still, you're bound to get run over, especially moving into the new millennium. Competition is going to be fierce. Fierce. And it's the hungry organizations, the hungry individuals, the hungry companies, the hungry PLCs, they're going to be able to benefit because we're not interested in no action talk only people. This is a different kind of NATO. We're interested in people that take action. And it's going to be fierce. It will be absolutely fierce. Winners are successful because they take action. They make the calls. They do what's necessary. And they don't just do their best. They force the issue. They're on the offensive. I've never seen a high-performance person go into the defensive mode. And just as I took on the FT recently, or one recently, I took him on a long time ago, um, all my British lawyers advised me against it. It's a no-win situation. The chances of winning are slim. The costs are great. It's the taking action. It's like Richard Ransom taking on British Air. Now that's a that's that's now that that to me is a no-win situation. Uh, but it's the difference. It's the difference in mindset. Some people say being a high-performance person is a difference in mindset. No, I don't think it's a difference in mindset, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> it's a difference in uh, in um, belief in yourself. The um, it's. I know that being a high-performance person, I'm a better business partner, as is Mr. Spielberg, who I've never been in business with, but this is the epitome of taking action. He says, he makes six decisions every 10 seconds and never looks back. He acts with utter confidence. This is Matt Damon about Mr. Spielberg when they were filming Saving Private Ryan. Now, I can relate to that. I've made over 65,000 business decisions in my career, and I'm not talking about note paper and pencils. 65,000, but when you figure that out, that's only six or eight decisions a day, every day, for 30 years. This entire room hasn't made 65,000 business decisions in your cumulative careers. We want to be a YTA. You take action. Don't think too much about it. You take action because your instincts are almost always right. Your instincts are almost always right. Your primal instincts, the instincts that's got us here as a species, homo sapien, erectus, whatever the hell that we're called. 